The following is intended for mature audiences only. Discretion is advised. Thank you so much for downloading this episode of So What Do You Really Do? The podcast where I, your host, Dater Dennis Maller, talks to artists and entertainers about their day jobs. And the artist and entertainer about today's day job is more the support for artistry and is a day job. I am going to speak to prop master extraordinaire Scott Reader and also TikTok famous. <laughs> we're going to talk a lot about TikTok. We're going to talk a lot about uh, his industry and we're going to talk a lot about, about what he has to do as a prop master and what he's doing when it comes to the world of social media and some of the things going on with uh, his particular world of social media right now. Oh, I made that sound super juicy or vaguely uninteresting. It's very fun. It's very interesting. I promise you. Uh, thank you so much, by the way, for being a part of the program. If you are a first time listener or viewer of the show, yes. So what do you really do is a podcast now on YouTube, part of the big comedy network. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. If you're a first time viewer, if you're a returning viewer, I also appreciate that. Thank you so much for being a part of it. I ask you one thing. If you're having fun, if you're here for someone that you really enjoy, you want to support them. If you have found anything in one of my episodes remotely interesting. What I ask is that you please leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, Anchor. Am I on Anchor? I don't know. The network now takes care of that stuff. Anywhere you're listening to this podcast, please leave a review. You can be honest. Even if you if you had a problem, uh, I'm sure somehow those reviews help with the algorithms. I don't know. The almighty algorithm. All oh, hail the algorithm. We're going to talk a lot about the algorithm in this podcast. Oh. Okay, maybe not a lot, but it comes up. Uh, it might also come up most of the time when you talk to me because I have uh, a disorder that is not fixed by medications and I obsess about a lot of things and I uh, frequently obsess about the algorithm when it comes to social media and stuff. Not that I want to, not because I have to, because sometimes I can't help myself. <laughs> oh, by the way, if you are a fan of my stand-up or if you want to be a fan of my stand-up, I'm going to be performing in not one but two comedy festivals coming up this fall. Uh, in October 22nd to the 29th, I will be in Plano, Texas. It's right outside of Dallas for the Plano Comedy Festival. I've been in the festival before uh, and I had to drop out uh, back in 2018 because I couldn't make it all the way out to Plano at the time because I was unemployed and working as a full-time entertainer and I had a broken car and not the money to fix it. Uh, so I ended back out of it in 2018. I did perform virtually in the Plano Comedy Festival during the pandemic. I was lucky enough to be some of the selected performers, uh, some of the performers in that uh, 2020 season. Uh, and I had a great time. And now I'm actually getting to go out there and see a lot of my fans uh, who are also comedians in Texas and around the country face to face yet again. So it's going to be or some face to face for the first time. Ooh, we might be podcasting with some pandemic friends when we get to Texas. Ah, we'll see. OK, I just did a 13 year old girl scream. Ah, it's Taylor Swift. OK, anyway. What accent was that? That was like a 13 year old girl who's got a southern accent. Okay. <laughs> Guys, I'm a little punch drunk and a little loopy from a lot of work and not a lot of sleep. Dude, I was like, look, I've changed my outfit. I'm wearing oh, hoodies are always hoodies. I'm wearing a baseball cap today in my house. It's it's fall in New England, so it's 58 degrees outside, and I am wearing a hoodie with shorts and sandals because I'm an insane white person. That's what I did. That's yeah, I'm one of those. Okay. Also, I'm wearing my Hello Corridor Crew uh, Adobe Premiere Media Not Found shirt. You can find one of these. We talk about Corridor Crew in the in the podcast. It's a coincidence. I'm wearing the shirt while talking and edit. literally I'm editing the show. <laughs> now I'm talking about it. Uh, I love the guys over at Corridor Crew. Uh, hopefully, maybe one day I'll talk to one of them and have one of them on the podcast. Nico, Sam, Ren, any of the guys. Jordan, come on the podcast. Let's talk. I want to know about the business of digital effects. All right. I'm very... ADD distract on this. And I posit I don't have ADD. Uh, I refuse to listen to a therapist who said I have OCD and ADD because I don't understand how I'm hyper-focused on being unfocused. It's, it doesn't make sense, but here we are making sense of it, <laughs> making it a reality. But anyway, so second comedy festival I'm going to be in this fall uh, is another podcast that, or another, sorry, festival that in 2018 was another one I had to back out of because I couldn't get down to New Orleans for the same reason that I didn't do Plano. <sighs> it's the Hell Yes Comedy Fest. And here's what the thing it is about it. 
I'm not just performing. We're going to be recording a live podcast. I'm also invited. The people at the Hell Yes Creative, you know, they had me, they, they gave me access a couple years ago. We cross paths and they see the work that I've been doing and like, hey, we want you to just come to the festival. Don't fill out a submission form. You don't have to pay a fee. Come be part of the program. We want you as a performer and we want to give you a space as, for your podcast. And I'm touched. I'm I'm overwhelmed with emotion about this. Like, this is a big, huge step. Somebody, it's the same thing when it came to the big comedy network. When they approached me, when they're like, hey, we've been seeing the work that you've been doing. And we, we, we love it. We're impressed. And it's just nice. For someone to want to help, who see what you're doing and that you're working hard and that they want to be a part of helping you get that message out there. It's, it's, it's nice to be liked, you know, because sometimes it doesn't always happen. It doesn't, or at least it doesn't always feel that way. You know, I, I talk a lot about my mental health and my mental illness and mental illness for other people. And besides obsessive compulsive disorder, which I'm very open about, but there's also, you know, depression and, and all that. And it's really easy. It's too easy to think that the world's against you and that everyone wants to see you fail. And that even better, even more likely that no one even cares. So when somebody does care, it feels good. So I'm really excited uh, in November to be heading down to New Orleans. and getting into a live podcast. It's going to be great. I'm going to love it. If you're in the Southern area, if you're in Louisiana area, please come check out uh, the show. It's going to be a daytime show. All the information is going to be on deadairdentist.com in the next coming days and weeks um, about all that stuff. And please come see me in Texas too. Uh, I've also been getting a lot of uh, positive feedback talking about, go back to the world of day jobs, my day job. Uh, Boston Duck Tour narrator, uh, tour guide for the Boston. Been getting a lot of good reviews uh, from passengers. You know, sometimes it's just obligation, and sometimes they really mean it. You know, and you meet people, and they're like, "Hey, man, this was great. Like, you're hilarious." You know, or "Man, I learned so much." And just I got to remember to focus on the good things when they come around because it's too easy to focus on the negatives. You know, and that's also one of the things that my guests and I talk about is how easy it is to spiral down the rabbit hole of trollery and sadness when it comes to the internet. So, but please go ahead and check out deadairdentist.com. A lot of information is going to be coming to the website over the next uh, few days and weeks about the Plano Comedy Festival and the Hell Yes Comedy Fest in New Orleans. It's going to be a good time and I'm really excited for it. So anyway, my guest. Ooh, not a pandemic friend, <laughs> which I know has been a con constant spin here on the podcast. But it is uh, a man who I have not yet met in person. It is a man, much like former guest of the show, uh, Jack the Whipper, Jack Lepiatters, uh, who was a previous guest, uh, famous for being a Renaissance Fair performer and, you know, made it big on TikTok. Jack and I still haven't met in person. Neither have my next guest, Scott Reeder. He's a, a prop master in Austin, Texas. Ooh, maybe I'll, when I'm in uh, Plano, a little hour and a half drive away to Austin, maybe I'll hang out with Scott. We'll see. Hopefully, Scott and I will work on a movie together soon. <laughs> we'll be hanging out on set uh, in between doing actual our actual jobs uh, on set. But uh, I came across his TikToks or Instagram reels or whatever, talking about prop stuff, and he's funny, and he's informative, and I love the behind-the-scenes stuff, and I could not uh, rush to finding Scott's email address and inviting him to be on the podcast. And he could not have replied faster to say, Hey, yes, I would love to do this. Uh, and one of the things that I even talk about in here, it's, we'll get to it towards the end of it. It's the last thing that we talk about is the Scott is dealing with, you know, internet copyrights or, you know, someone stealing his content, which is very near and dear to my heart is that, that, that intellectual property theft, and people profiting from it. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the business of props. We're going to talk about Texas film industry. It's a lot of really good, interesting product. And of course, we're going to talk about 
some good old fashioned puns and dad jokes, because that is Scott's second best job to his best job being a prop master for film and television. And we get to talk about some really great celebrity uh, moments. It's a fun, interesting podcast. Scott was a great guy. I really enjoyed uh, talking to him and hearing his stories. And I hope you, too, also enjoy my conversation with prop master and dad joke teller Scott Reader. That's the best part about technology now is that we can have that conversation while we're in different places and then we can just have constant con- conversations about, oh, how's the weather? Where are you at? While the weather here is being kooky. Well, the weather's there being kooky too. And it's just nonstop crazy weather talk here on yeah. a podcast about day jobs. <laughs> so, which, all right. So you're in Austin, Texas. Mm-hmm. Are you Correct. from Austin? You were born and raised there? I'm, so you've I'm actually seen... from the Houston area, but yeah, I've, I've okay. uh, worked kind of all over, though. Okay, because what I was wondering is, you've been able to see the, tr- the couple-year transition change of what's been happening in Austin with the entertainment industry, like, a, you know, 10 years ago, mm-hmm. it was just, you know, kind of a regular, normal city in Texas, and now there's been a huge explosion of uh, industry there, of entertainment, of people moving there as someone who is a native Texan, what is your, uh, what have the, how has it been for you seeing the transition of Texas or Austin, particularly from, um, just a Texas city to now it being this cultural hub of, of people with curly Q mustaches and rickshaw bicycles. Well, you know, the art scene and the film scene has been going on quite a while. Um, since the late nineties in Austin, um, they've, uh, Austin was really quick to, uh, embrace the film industry. Um, it started with Robert Rodriguez, uh, back in the nineties doing, uh, oh geez, of course, what is it? The big Robert El Rodriguez, Mariachi. El Mariachi. And, um, so he built a studio, of uh, uh, early two thousands, uh, out of the old, uh, a portion of the old Austin airport. So he got some hangers. He made a deal with the city and he's got, uh, like three sound stages out there. And that's kind of what started it. Um, then Richard Linklater did Dazed and Confused in the early 90s and he continued to make, um, his more independent films here. Of course, he's gone and, and done commercial stuff like School of Rock with Jack Black and whatnot. But he, uh, he'll come back here and do his indie features when he can. Um, so there's that b- a b- a film, a base of filmmakers and they started the Austin film society. So that's been going on. The, uh, the music scene has always been huge here, uh, as far as the live music scene. Um, but lately now you have, you know, uh, people like, uh, I guess Joe Rogan has moved here. Who else has moved <laughs> yeah. here? Um, as far as he's really, and he started up a comedy club and it brings in a lot of stand up comedians here, from what I hear. Um, there's uh, a, a ton of YouTubers here. So that that's the, the big influx has kind of been more in new technology and, uh, well, when I say new technology, uh, more like streamers and YouTubers, uh, uh, like Ryan Trahan and uh, Mr. Ballin on YouTube, who's got like. 10 million followers. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's been interesting watching it all, uh, how it's all unfolding. <laughs> well, the most interesting thing that to, to see is with how big Texas and Austin itself has exploded with that during the COVID-19. A lot of people left Hollywood during that time frame because there was more open, uh, mm-hmm. or l- less laxed, uh, restrictions to COVID and mass and stuff in, Texas, so a lot of them move there. So you've been watching this boom. Do you think, other than you know, with COVID in 2020 and and that, is there anything else you think that has caused a lot more industry to move to Texas? Because even as a comedian, I've been watching how much bigger the industry is looking at the comedians in Austin area, whereas before, like New York, L.A., Chicago, San Francisco were like the biggest comedy hubs for for industry to start pulling people now they're definitely pulling people from austin texas and they're definitely looking at people there so do you think is it do you think covid ex, expanded or excelled rather or in, in, increased the speed of industry moving there or do you think there was other factors involved 
I think that that was one of the contributing factors for sure. Um, there's also, I guess, it's uh, may, maybe there's b- business incentives. Um, uh, a lot of uh, some film industry vendors I had talked to who were considering moving here just because of the uh, environmental restrictions they have. Uh, I know it's getting a little off topic from uh, comedy, but there's a, you know, I. Uh, I do a lot of videos about what we use in the film industry, you know, uh, stunt props and whatnot. Yeah. There's a company that does breakaway glass, and the um, the environmental business restrictions uh, of operating in California were just getting to where they're like, well, we're you know we may have to move out of the state, you know, to to be able to continue to operate um, because of uh, you know environmental restrictions on the breakaway materials, you know, what, you know, because that, I guess I'm not sure that the materials they use are recyclable or whatnot, but it's just, it's stuff like that. It's, it's, it's state policies uh, for businesses and whatnot. And um, yeah. And Texas has now signed a $200 million film incentive. Uh, that's things when the strike's over, it's going to get crazy here. Yeah, that's a, a very contri- big, huge contributing factor is tax incentives. Because, like, I remember mm-hmm. you know, me as an actor here in New England, a lot of work is here in New England because of the tax you know, tax breaks here in Massachusetts. And Rhode Island's pretty good, too, and they get a lot of, of work as well, but it's mostly here in Massachusetts, mm-hmm. you know, for the tax incentives. But then you also had, like, you know... Uh, Right before was it Katrina that that destroyed uh, New New Orleans? Louisiana mm-hmm. had just started doing a tax credit, and they were going to be the next big filming hub. And then they had to scrap the tax incentive for films to use to rebuild after the Katrina flood. And that's when Georgia jumped jumped mm-hmm. on on it on the opportunity, and then they became the big filming hub. So. Yeah, that is a huge factor. Yeah, Louisiana did keep their incentive, though. So the way it worked, because they kept getting movies there, because I, I did several of them. Um, oh, uh, yeah, you know better than me. And, like, I did one there in 2007 and 2011. I did one of the first in 2004. So you're you're correct about that timeline. They had just passed it in 2004. But Katrina killed so much of their infra- infrastructure that they kind of had, they pressed pause on it. It just, it wasn't physically... Uh, a possibility to go film there uh, because so much got wiped out. Um, uh, Then that did kind of open it up for Shreveport and Baton Rouge. Uh, But yeah, they kept their incentive going. It was just the ability to shoot there was not possible. Um, But yeah, you're right. Georgia uh, picked up. Um, I, I, I gotta give a shout out to Rhode Island because I did, uh, I did an AMC series there uh, since you brought up Rhode Island, and uh, that was Nosferatu. I did Nosferatu. One of the best times I've ever had. My family loved it. I rented a house in Jamestown, uh, uh, you know, a block off of the uh, uh, the bay, over you know, looking over to Newport, and we just had the best time. I was there for about five months. I did background on a, a couple episodes for Nosferatu, and I have to say that that is the most efficient. Well put together set that I've ever been on. I've seen some sets that are, and I don't do a lot of acting, but I've done a fair amount since 2018 when I left the radio industry. Mm-hmm. I've done a, uh, I've seen a lot of sets that are just utter chaos. Uh, and I will drop names. <laughs> uh, the Liam Neeson movie where he's an honest thief mm-hmm. was an absolute mess. <laughs> but yeah. Nosferatu was so organized, everything was efficient. I think that's the only production where every day I worked on it was a short day. I still got paid for my eight hours, but we went in and out. We were done. I don't think a single day that I ever worked more than six hours, but still got paid my full eight because they got everything they needed uh, and quickly. So that's awesome that we were both on the same production. We could have been, we could have just been hanging out on a date and, and not even known it. Probably snacking at craft service together. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was a fun one. You're, and you're right. It was very efficient. They have, uh, we had two different uh, line producers on that and, um, one of them, who's a local uh, Rhode Island guy, who uh, I'm trying to think of what else he does, but he's he could really run, run a good crew. Um, everyone was top notch on that, from the assistant directors down. Um, yeah, I I really enjoyed. it. Well, let's go back now. We've you know established where you're at and your 
where you're at in the industry and what you do. Where did you get your start in doing props? When you were, did you come up in a film family? Was it something that you discovered at a young age? Because like me, obviously community theater. You know, I, I've I'm I'm a in front of and behind the spotlight guy, because where I grew up in in community theater, we all did everything. We had to do uh, do spotlights. We had to do sound. And I learned that stuff growing up where I needed to be both talent and tech mm-hmm. to do all the sound. Is that, uh, and I find a lot of people end up finding themselves behind the camera because they wanted to be in front of the camera, but they just fell in love with the behind the camera stuff. Is that where you started? Or how did you get your start in the entertainment industry? Well, I always knew I wanted to be involved in it in some form or fashion, but from the, in the little small Texas town I was growing up in, uh, it didn't seem possible. Uh, so what I did was I, I transferred, I did my first year down in Southeast Texas of college, uh, went to University of North Texas. Um, I found out about, um, a, uh, and I was signed up for film classes and all that, but I, I couldn't get into anything that was like hands-on film production. It was just like film theory classes. So I found out there was a, I got really lucky. There was a movie filming in town called Daddy's Dying, Who's Got the Will? And this dates me. This is like 19, <laughs> that 19, is a title. <laughs> 1989. Um, yeah, it was a movie with Judge Reinhold, uh, Beverly D'Angelo, you know, from the vacation movies. Vacation movies. Uh, who else? Bo Bridges. Anyway, it was, it was fun. Um, but I found out they were filming at a hospital. I was, uh, working some alumni event. Um, and I I met the hospital administrator. That's how random this was. And he said, oh, you know, they're filming at my hospital on Monday. You should come by and check it out. So that's what I did. I just kind of showed up at the film set and offered up, <laughs> offered to pick up trash, whatever I could. So I kind of got like a, a little unpaid internship there. And um, uh, I kind of like you said, I, I dabbled in a little bit of everything. I was... Uh, you know, kind of a PA where they'd hand me a, uh, a radio and I'd have go lock up the street, you know, to keep uh, to keep traffic away from where we were filming, that sort of thing. But that's how I learned all the little different, you know, all the positions and kind of got a feel for what I wanted to do. They were shorthanded in the prop department. So that's how I ended up working props on that show. Um, but I did I did a little bit. Of, you just got to be proactive. I went in. Uh, I uh, got a uh, an internship with the uh, film commission, the North Texas Film Commission, and that was strategic because they're the first ones to get the scripts. So if a producer's coming to Texas, they reach out to the film commission for photos of locations. So um, so I would know about the productions before they would come to town, and then I could get my you know resume on the top of the stack kind of thing, and um, that's kind of how I got started. I did. I worked on karaoke videos. I uh, helped do <laughs> casting for that. I did worked camera. Um, you know, I, I like I said, I did a little bit of everything. I was the camera PA for the Bud Light film crew in 1993, where we traveled. Uh, we we filmed in like 150 bars um, over the course of the summer. That was my job right out of college. So. Uh, yeah, I just did did a little bit of everything. Oh well, there's probably 150 bars right down Sixth Street, right there in Austin. <laughs> we, we, yeah, we hit a lot of the Sixth Street ones too. <laughs> yeah, you just go down door to door to door to door. Mm-hmm. Yep, Shakespeare's. I remember. So that's amazing that you got started just by going to a set, uh, unsolicited. Is like, hey, I want to work in the business. I'll do anything because mm-hmm. that is definitely not a way to get into the industry now with the way security is way where well background checks are. Yeah. I can't imagine somebody just walking up to a random set and like, Hey, I want to work here. And somebody going, okay. Yeah. Well, you know what, you, what can be done though, you could still do that, but you can say, Hey, you just got to know who to ask for. You can say is the second AD. Cause if you, if you're going up to a film set, odds are you're going to go up to where the base camp is. And you say, uh, can I talk to the second assistant director? Right. Because they're the ones that are going to be standing around the trailers and just say, hey, can you give me an email? I'd like to get my resume in. I'd love to do some PA work. Um, And, you know, that's just it's all about just getting that foot in the door. 
Um, personally, I think one of the best ways, because I hire from the commercial world a lot if I'm looking for assistance. Um, and the reason I do that is if you work as an art assistant on a commercial, you do everything, especially outside of yeah. California. Um, it's uh, If you're an art assistant on a – it could be a Ford commercial – you're doing special effects. You're doing the set building, props. You're rounding up uh, picture cars, vehicles. Um, you kind of do it all. So, and that's where you find those go getters that really, you know, if they have the right stuff for it, they're you know, and they, you know, made it through uh, two or three commercials. Those are the kind of people you want on your team. That's my my personal experience. Yeah, me as someone who, you know, uh, I'm a, I, I work in radio. I do stand up comedy, comedy. I'm an actor. I do everything I can possibly can, but also in the tech world. And my specialty is audio. And I will do audio uh, for my friends' productions. And that's how I figured it out because we needed to. So I don't mind doing that tech stuff. But when you're, I feel, feel like there's so few trained audio people. It's mostly cameramen that have to like fit in the independent world, have to figure out how to do audio just because they need to enough so many audio tutorials up until the mm -hmm. most recent few years. But I feel like so many tutorials on YouTube were just cameramen going, I bought a zoom H four N the microphone plugs in here. You press record here. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of other things, but I don't know what they are. All right. Hit like, and s subscribe. So <laughs> up until a yeah. few years ago, there was very little YouTube tutorials out there. So where did you, you learned on the job how to become a mm -hmm. prop master. Yeah. Um, so be, prior to the internet, as you were growing up, cause you're a few years older than me, you grew up pre internet world. Mm -hmm. Was there a resource for you to start figuring out how to create your own props, create breakaway glass? What was the source of information for you for learning? Well, while I was a senior at university of North Texas, a movie came to town called necessary roughness. I'm I'm skipping some stuff, but um, I I I got in with the um, because I had a little bit of prop background. I got in with the prop master, and I learned a lot from him. And I was with that same guy for years uh, as a prop assistant, prop buyer, and that's how I learned a lot of the trade. And it really started with it was a football movie called Necessary Roughness back in 1991. Okay. Um, and I ended up doing all the props for their second unit photography, everything on a football field, basically. I was kind of a glorified football trainer. But I did work <laughs> other scenes than that. That's where I learned uh, you know, about breakaways and stunt props and all that. We had bar fights and everything. Um, I also, but the whole time, you know, we're all, I mean, I'd say, I bet 25% of a film crew, if not more are all aspiring writers and directors. So, you yeah. know, I was, uh, I ne wasn't necessarily wanting to act or be in front of the camera, but I wanted to write and direct. So I wrote and directed a feature called boondoggle back in 98, where I made a deal with, I was working on the Walker, uh, the Chuck Norris Walker series at the time. And I made a deal with the producer where during our hiatus, I could use the camera package. It was a, a 16 millimeter Aeroflex. And um, I just had to pay the insurance on it. It was an incredible deal. So in Panavision, they agreed oh, to it. Huge deal. That's awesome. And uh, so yeah, I did the festival circuit with it. We never got distribution, but it was an incredible learning experience. Um, but that's where I, I learned some sound on that. I had... Uh, I borrowed somebody's. Remember the Nagra? Oh, is that the 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 Nagra recorders? Is that the ones that the CIA used to commission, and then after they would commission a new one, they would release the old one. Well, all I know is with the Nagra, it was it was what we used to record sound on. You know, for low budget independent films, it was a Nagra recorder, and um, I. Uh, I barred it one weekend because I was lacking a lot of Foley sounds, you know, that I needed. And uh, I just ran around town just recording sounds like I needed like a wheelchair banging up against a cabinet. And I would just <laughs> just running around <laughs> recording Foley. And then the rest we'd get from a sound library. But uh, um, 
What's funny is with all my videos, I've done all these, you know, TikToks and YouTube shorts. Um, and I've, I've done a lot of videos about how the props that I use, that Foley artists are what make my props sound good, you know. And uh, I've become friends with like two or three established Los Angeles Foley artists. Uh, and that's all they do is they, you know, they go through and record, you know, all the, all the background Foley, um, not just background, foreground Foley too, I guess, uh, you know, footsteps, <laughs> footsteps, uh, you know, uh, smacking from, you know, fists, you know, during a fist fight, uh, you know, glass breaking, they do all that. Uh, and to this day, I've never in person met a Foley artist, but, um, what we do is so intertwined, you know, as far as what I try yeah. to provide on the day that we're filming, um, we don't have time to go in and get those little, you know, uh, those little sounds. But what, w how we help the Foley artist is we'll have silent props, like uh, we'll have silent grocery bags so they can record yeah. the dialogue. Um uh, and get a clean, you know, clean cut of dialogue. And then the Foley artist will go in and add the, the rustle of a grocery bag where it's controlled. Um, you know, if we're in a bar scene, I'll have, you know, prop pool balls, you know, painted racket balls that look like billiard balls, but they're not. Uh, and that way the background can be playing pool and, uh, it doesn't, step on the dialogue so you were working for another prop master when did you decide to go on your own and create your own prop company well you know i uh it's really not really you don't have to have a prop company necessarily i did start a prop shop when i moved to austin but that was separate i uh um i just kind of i got a call about my uh my old boss wasn't prop mastering as much. He was he had moved over into set decoration, so I had um, I gotten a call about a movie back in two thousand one, and I think that was my first movie to prop master was in two thousand one, and uh, and I just it's just kind of word of mouth. I just started getting calls to prop master, and then when. Uh, I gotten out of the business for a little while and I worked as did marketing for landmark theaters in Dallas, uh, decided that wasn't for me. And I got jumped back into production 2003 and, uh, and just started prop mastering at that point. Well, first let's explain the difference between what a set decorator is and what a prop master is for the people listening who are not involved in the industry and don't know what the difference between that would so be. So prop master does everything touched or held, right? It's anything touched or held. If you can pick it up, you know, Coke can, your phone. Um, set decoration is like a painting, you know, something hanging on the wall, uh, a couch, um, you know, a rug. Um, if it's, you know, part of the set to, to fill a room with furniture, um, that sort of thing. Um, there are some like gray areas sometimes, like if, if the scene is two furniture movers moving the couch, I guess technically the couch is a prop, but that's not, that doesn't happen too often. <laughs> um, and, and there are gray areas it's just for those repossession commercials. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's uh, th that's the difference. Is the set decorators they dress the sets, the furniture, the wall hangings, and the prop master. Uh, it, like say, if it's a, a bar scene, I do all the glassware. I do all the breakaway glassware. If there's a bar fight, if somebody takes a chair and hits it over someone else's head, I'll get with the special effects department, or I'll just hire someone to make a balsa wood chair. Um, that that sort of thing. If it's a, a shoot, if it's a shootout, you know, if it's a gunfight, I'll provide all the prop weapons. Um, I'll hire the armor. You know, I typically don't like to armor myself because you then you're doing two jobs, uh, I, and I don't like having my focus split. You know, um, so especially for something as as important as armor when you're mm -hmm. working with weaponry with that you know blanks and stuff like that now we have a lot more with the you know it's a lot more safety in the the stage when you're using 
what do you call it with the little pellet guns that look like real guns? Yeah, airsoft, muscle flares. Yeah, airsoft. You can add muscle flare, uh, muscle fire, and flare, and smoke all that in in pose. But still, part, yeah. it's still a very. And I think as we all learned with the movie Rust, uh, how important it mm-hmm. is to be on point with paying attention to what's going on with the w- the armor has to be very uh, much in charge of what's happening with the weaponry and be on set paying attention to what's going on, and experience goes a long way. Oh, for sure. Um, so I can understand where somebody would like, yeah, I don't want to pull my focus away from safety because somebody is worried about, you know, th- that we need a couple extra pint glasses that'll be broken on later on or whatever it is. So, yeah, it does sound like a lot uh, uh, in general that set decorator props and on-set effects people work a lot of hand-in-hand hand because me? you guys have crossover in a lot of your equipment and what you guys do. Oh, yeah. we It's all about communication. We just talk. We, you know, we have meetings ahead of time and say, oh, I'm doing this. You're doing that, you know, or you know, or do you want me to do this for you? Uh, that sort of thing, you know. And, you know, we just work together. It's, it's Like I said, it's all about just communicating and making sure you're not doubling up or that something falls between the cracks, you know. You, and, uh, yeah, we, we uh, for television, you know, one, one thing is there's a big difference between prop mastering or television versus a feature film. And I love doing both, to be honest. When I do a feature film, I'm on set more. If I'm doing television, I'm in perpetual prep. I'm always prepping the next episode. You know, so I'm in director meetings, I'm in concept meetings, all that. Uh, and so I'm not able to be on set as much. So I really have to have a very strong on set assistant prop master that is dealing with the actors and working, you know, you know, working the set. But if I'm on a feature film, I've done all the prep ahead of time and I can spend more, you know, a lot more time on set, you know, one-on-one with the actors and the director. For you as a prop member maker or prop master, we talked uh, a lot about breakaway glass and certain props that are, you know, the, the safety prop as opposed to a hero prop. Do you, make a lot of that stuff on your own or do you have to order most of it from a, where would you order it? Do you have to try and find this stuff? Well, it depends on the show. I mean, uh, I did a show called revolution for NBC where I had an in-house fabricator. I hired a guy that his office was next to mine and we had a fab shop where, you know, we had every actor got captured at the end of every episode and they'd lose their weapons. (laughs) So we were constantly designing new weapons for every episode. So we were just churning them out like a factory, be it swords and guns and whatnot. Um, If it like the show, I'm doing the reboot of Walker uh, currently. Well, I say currently when the strike's over, we'll start back up. We finished in March. Yeah, Is that the one with Jared Padalino or Padalino? Padalaki. Yeah. yeah, From um, Supernatural. Supernatural. Um, and Gilmore Girls. Yep. And uh, he's a great guy, by the way. And I'd worked with him on uh, uh, Friday the 13th, uh, the the reboot of that in 2009. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people say that he's super nice. He's yeah. actually really good to work with. In fact, a friend of mine has been doing some uh, small roles on the Walker reboot before the uh, pandemic or before the strike hit. Yeah. So what we, um, what we do on that show is um, 100% airsoft. Uh, so we, we rely on visual effects to handle all the, uh, muzzle flash and shell ejection and all that. Um, I occasionally have to have something fabricated. Uh, it just depends on the script. Like, um, uh, oh man, like it could be syringes, um, a, a fake, um, block and tackle, like a big chain thing that with a hook in a warehouse where I had a bad guy try to hit or hit hits Jared with it. Um, so I'll find the block and tackle, have it molded. I have, there are several people here in town um, that are really good at molding and I'll hire them. I, I just don't have time, you know, as far as I'm, <laughs> uh, or even, uh, I don't even have the manpower to do it all in house. So I'll hire, I'll hire someone on contract to make uh, specific, you know, specialty props kind of thing. Then there's the the usual things like a crowbar or a frying pan or a cinder block. 
um, yeah. that there's there's like there's a, several companies that that sell that stuff. Uh, NewRuleEffects.com has has good stuff. Um, there are um, there are rental houses out of Los Angeles that I use quite a bit. Independent Studio Services, Hand Prop Room, uh, History for Hire. I'm, I'm doing actually in the middle of doing a video about History for Hire. Um, but you know, all those companies are suffering right now. They've all had to like cut their uh, cut their staff in half because of the strike because there's just no work. Um, I'm just hoping that they, there's, there are hundreds of vendors out there that are, you know, support the film industry. Um, and I just hope they survive it, you know? Well, we'll talk about, uh, the strike in, in a little <laughs> bit. I want to know more about, are, are, so after a production is done, if you had things fabricated, do you keep them? Do they belong to the production company? Are you amassing a warehouse of different kinds of weird uh, safety props that you're like trying to think of ways to use like if a production comes to you and they're like hey we need a crowbar oh I got one of them from the last production that I kept well yeah I do a lot of that you know and I have my little prop shop I have Austin props here in town uh, and I rent to other productions and commercials um, what I'll do at the end of a show um, the hero props will go to Warner Brothers or the CW whoever you know, is, you know, the, whoever the production company is. Um, and then they'll often do a sale or I'll like make an offer and say, I'll pay you such and such amount of money for this batch of stuff. You know, um, you know, that's, that's kind of how I amass stuff, uh -huh. you know, like I made, what's a, your favorite prop that you've gotten from a production? Like one that means something to you. Uh, you know, there was a, Something I've kept with me for years and years uh, on necessary roughness. We had, uh, I'm not a big, massive sports fan, but I definitely, being from Texas, I appreciate football. Um, but we had a scene where we had all these great, like, Hall of Fame football players in to play a Texas prison team, right? So I grabbed one of the footballs with permission from my boss and had all of that all of these great football stars signed this football and I've, I, I've had it with me ever since. Um, but it's like, it was like Jerry Rice, Roger Craig, Tony Dorsett, oh, wow. uh, Randy White, uh, even Evander Holyfield, the boxer was, he was in that scene. Got him to sign. There's Dick Butkus, all, like a lot of old, big, great, you know, players. Who else? Herschel Walker, Judge. Uh, Oh, what is it? Jim Kelly? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was just... That's cool. So that's less a prop that you're going to use on a different production. No, that just sits that, in your yeah, office. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. just something yeah. I've carried along with me. Um, I feel like I ended up with one of the prop uh, Texas Ranger badges that Chuck Norris wore. Um, that's oh, kind of cool. cool. Um, uh, well, that's kind of pretty much it. Everything else I kind of recycle and repurpose. <laughs> is that, what is the the strangest or the weirdest or the most difficult prop that they had to get you to source? Mm, well, see, that's kind of difficult because I've done a lot of a lot of productions. A lot of it is the time you you have so little time to do it. Like with Revolution, where we were making swords. Oh. This is this is a funny story. I did a movie called Machete. It's a Robert Rodriguez show starring yeah. Danny Trejo, uh, but we had like we had some big names in it. Um, what De Niro? We had Robert De Niro in it, and uh, Steven Seagal, and uh, <laughs> uh, he would not. We there was a scene where he's in fighting with a samurai sword. And when I showed him the swords I had for that scene, he was like, no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> that, those samurai swords, uh, they're like toothpicks in my hands. And <laughs> so. That sounds, <laughs> sounds exactly like something Steven Seagal would say. That was, it, those were his exact words. They're like toothpicks in my hands. And uh, I told Jack Black that story and he like, then he started doing that same impression. <laughs> toothpicks in my hands and uh he really said that so we had to make him jumbo 
samurai swords at the last minute. That was kind of tough. Uh, but I found a guy uh, that would make, make them. Uh, out of all the Seagal stories I heard, that's the most delightful one. Because I've heard a lot of bad stories about Seagal. Well, I could say more, but I don't know. You know, he's... <laughs> What wasn't the easiest person to work with? Let's just say that. Uh, well, you know, honestly, you know, and that goes a long way on set. Like, I, I think that's that's no new. Every, everyone knows that. <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, that's being easy to work with on set goes a long way. And I can honestly say that from from personal experience. I was mm-hmm. working on the TV. I was doing background on an episode of. Castle Rock, mm-hmm. which was a Hulu mm-hmm. uh, original series about that takes place in the world of Stephen King, mm-hmm. and I showed up because I'm a I'm a, a, a consummate always early kind of guy, so I show up early. I'm just doing background, right? I don't wanna, if I don't even show up, they don't even care. Like it's you know background, they don't care about us in any way, shape, or form. But you know we are as important to the movie business as everyone else. Mm-hmm. So I show up for early, sure. like super early, and they're like, "We're not even ready and holding for you yet. Go have lunch, right?" So I go over to, to catering, you know, I'm standing there on my plate. They're doing like to make order, uh, like grilled, grilled food to make order. Mm-hmm. And when a guy comes over and he's frantically, you know, trying to get his food and he can go back to, to get and set up and he didn't have a plate and they're like, plates are all the way over there. He's standing here at the food and he's like, oh man, I got to get a plate. I'll bring it back. And I just turned and went here, take my plate. Your food's ready. My food's still a couple more minutes away. I'll walk over and get a new plate. And he's like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, no, here, take the plate. So he gets his food. I get my food. We sit down. He comes up to me. He's like, hey, what's going on, man? How you doing? I'm so-and-so. I run the sound department, this, that, whatever. I was like, oh, cool. Nice to meet you. You know, and we're talking and back and forth. He goes, so what are you doing on the production? And I went, oh, I'm just working background today. And I just watched the look on his face just drop. Because I what I get from the scenario was, he was like, hey, here's somebody who's really cool and nice. He must be a crew member. Mm-hmm. I want to work with him again in the future because he seems like a nice person. And then when he found out I was an actor, <laughs> you could just be like, oh, man, I wanted you for crew because you were a really cool person, which goes a long way. That's how a lot yeah. of people get you work from work to work, as I'm sure you can say, attest to is that if you're easy to work with, if you're you don't even have a, like if, as long as you're just a pleasant person to be around, they're going to want to mm-hmm. work with you again. For, for, sure, for sure. As you can attest, especially in a smaller film community like, you know, because. Because I'm I'm very familiar with you know with Rhode Island, Massachusetts. They they all know each other. They're all buddies. Mm-hmm. And if you're if 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 you're not easy to work with, people will not won't call you. You know, it's you, you've got to build a good reputation. And you know, as someone, you don't want to make someone's life more difficult. So who wants that, right? So you just you got to be someone that can you know work well and make make others' lives easier. You know, you don't want to. You know, let people walk all over you, but you also want to, you know, you want to play nice with others, you know. But, yeah, it's a good point. It's a small, uh, you got small film communities all over the United States, and you got to, you know, keep uh, keep up your good name. <laughs> Being in Austin, uh, do you, tra- like, obviously you've mentioned you've come up here to New England, you know, people in L.A., I'm sure you've done productions across what do you think the percentage of your work is travel and how much do you work in Texas and how much work that is travel that you turn down because you don't feel that it's worth moving? I turned down a lot of out of state work. Um, I've turned down numerous Georgia. You know, I've never worked in Georgia. Um, I've just been fortunate to be able to work here a lot. Um, when I have gone out of town, like when I went to Rhode Island, that was a favor for a very good friend of mine who was a line producer mm-hmm. um, that had done a show here. Um, I'll I'd say twenty five percent I do out of town, seventy five percent I stay home. So that's that's the way I like it. You know, occasionally I'll travel, not too often. Like the last you- the last out of state job I did was twenty nineteen. I did a, a you know a show. Uh, what's it called breaking news in Yuba County in uh, Mississippi? Okay. Do you not travel because it's not worth your time, or in, uh, it's not worth your time and money to travel? Or is there certain areas that you want to go to? Like for me as an actor, I know a lot of work in Georgia is non-union acting. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know about the crew side of IATSE side or, or or Georgia or anything like that. But is it do you do you try to avoid certain areas because 
it's it's not going to be you don't want to contribute to bad business practices oh no nothing it's all about family i'd much rather be i'd much rather be at home with my i've got you know a wife and two okay. kids you know so that's that's what it's all based on really is to be close close to my family that's good and there's plenty of work in texas for you too so that sounds like a good thing uh, so let's talk about the strike because you've done a couple episodes of of your shorts um talking and discussing the, the strike and like there was a really great uh one you did where a bunch of prop masters and sect decorators took over a parking lot and just did like an open house which i love that like i yeah, would have loved tail, to have been there and party. checked that out and walked around it was fun yeah a tailgate party you called it like a, a set a, a prop prop tailgate party yeah, it was because everyone, uh, you know, that was when the rider strike was really hitting and there wasn't any work in L.A. Uh, everybody had their trucks parked at the same place, so we just had a big tailgate party. And uh, I was supposed to be doing a commercial that week, and then that fell through. So I just said, I asked my wife, I said, hey, you want to go to L.A.? <laughs> so we went. It was a blast. <laughs> we really enjoyed well, it. For, for right now, since you're not able to work because of the strikes, because of two other unions right now, mm-hmm. what, how how much of a strike, and you don't have to talk about personal finances, I don't want to know all that, I'm just wondering in general, for you as a business owner who's trying to find work, are you trying to find more work with the small few approved programs, are you waiting it out, like, where is it with you as a small business owner in this business that's that's paused because of not what you want to do? Yeah, luckily commercials can still shoot. Um, I I got a big commercial in July, which really helped. Um, so I've done two commercials since the strikes hit, um, and then I filled in with uh, you know I, I still get some rentals um, to those you know interim agreement productions. Um, and I've been, you know, making content, you know, as far as, uh, you know, with YouTube and TikTok, and that's helped, you know, helped a bit as well. And, uh, yeah, just kind of scratching it up where I can. <laughs> but, yeah, I've got some rentals. So, like I said, you know, there, there, there are some commercials still shooting um, in town. So that, that I'm making rentals on that. Well, that also, you you know, transitioned right perfectly into my next conversation piece is the social media stuff. Were you doing these TikToks and YouTube shorts? And of course I see them now because I I'm, I'm subscribed to you because I saw your, your post about, and we'll, we'll talk all about the imposter thing in a moment. I want to know the creation of the social media, uh, aspect of it. Was this pre strike, uh, already, were you already making these short TikToks for social media before the strike and you oh, yeah. amped it up or did you start because of the strike? Oh no, I've been doing this. Uh, I started because of the pandemic. Yeah. You know, okay. I started out just doing dad jokes on TikTok. Um, you know, my daughter was always on TikTok and she, I was like, what are you doing? She showed it to me. I downloaded the app, saw some, uh, old guys, uh, attempting to tell dad jokes. And I was like, well, I can do that. So I ended up getting a following of about 100,000 followers on TikTok just with my straight up dad jokes. Um, Then I got back uh, uh, when things loosened up uh, during the pandemic. We started uh, back on the, it was an Amazon series I was working on. And one of my assistants said, hey, man, why don't you do some stuff about what we do, you know, tell, tell your audience about the props. And I started out by just busting a breakaway bottle on my head or whatnot. That was, um, uh, uh, August, August of 2020 when I started doing the prop videos and man, they took off. I did one on silent grocery bags, uh, end of August, 2020 and, uh, silent grocery bags and silent pool balls. And I added a stupid dad joke at the end and it had like 3 million views overnight and ended up getting over 12 million views for the whole run. It was insane. And that's, and it just shot up that I was, you know, with both in a year, I had a million followers on TikTok. Now I'm at 1.7 million, about to hit a million subscribers on YouTube. I say, I mean, I'm at like 830,000 subscribers on YouTube now. Um, and, you know, just doing that. I don't have any big brand deals or anything, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, 
It's been fun. Well, I like that. That's what the shows that you're an innovative person, you know, and that because you work in entertainment, so you can see what the other things are. There's so many people, especially around our o- older ages. You know, I'm 42. You're a little bit older than me. You know, it's very easy for people of our generation, of our Gen Xers, to look at TikTok and go, "Oh, that's dumb dance videos," and I don't want to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. And you're not part of that. You're innovative. You're changing with the times, which is something very necessary in our business because you know what you could be a stickler about whatever resin goes into breakaway glass when there's a newer alternative and you can just sit stern and just go i'm not changing whether the product's better or not i don't care but (laughs) you know as somebody being in the industry yet you have to follow innovation so it's i'm glad that you saw hey what's this new thing all right let me see how i can use it and let me see how to make it mine what's funny is I'm, i've never really typically been that person to uh grasp on the new technology that easy um uh it just kind of it, it just was a happy accident it, the way it worked out uh luckily i'll say luckily the tiktok platform was so easy that i i mean it wasn't difficult i didn't get frustrated and quit it i was like oh this is pretty easy to throw together um and then I just kind of started embracing the technology. Then I figured out other ways to where I didn't really like the editing of uh, like I didn't really enjoy editing in the TikTok app. So I found another like editing yeah. app for my phone called InShot. I really like it, and um, and I learned you know to kind of that inside and out. And I'm I'm not a master editor at all. I really <laughs> I really kind of suck, but I know enough to put together a cohesive, you know, little video. All right. And now this is where I'm curious about when it comes to props and the dad jokes, the corny puns at the end, which concept comes first for the video? Do you go, Oh, here's an interesting prop idea. And then try to find, write the joke about it. Or do you come up with a joke and go, Oh, I'm going to use that joke in a prop video about bags. Now, you know, What's funny is people assume that that's the case. The joke does not come first. The joke comes, I mean, I I come up with the subject matter of what I want to teach people about. You know, this is what I want to talk about. And but I'll I'll sit and chew on it for a couple of weeks if I can't find a good way to 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 send it home. You know what I mean? I'll I'll just mull over and try to figure out, okay, how can I work in the joke at the end? <laughs> You know, because it's expected now, right? Yeah. And uh, and I, you know, I don't know how I do it, but I just, uh, you know. And what's funny is some of them no one ever gets, but I think it's funny, and that's okay with me. It's just like some people will get it. As a comedian, I got to say, write the jokes that make you laugh and hope you find the audience mm-hmm. that laughs with you. Yeah. Which, you know, and I, I, I hate puns. I hate them so much. But I think the well, only way to properly deliver a pun. <laughs> no, no. Well, the, I, you do what I what I think the proper way to deliver a pun is, is you deliver it and you know that it's bad. Like, you mm-hmm. know that it's a pun, that you know that you're going to, it's a groaner. Like, you just lean in on it and you go, ah, here's that, here's that pun. And, uh, you know, I, I, I enjoy them. I honestly, the reason you're here is because I discovered your, your, your channel just flipping through doom scrolling through TikTok. Mm-hmm. And I came across it and started hearing a prop thing. And I went, oh, somebody talking about behind the scenes stuff that is not involved. And I went to swipe on it. Oh, no, he's with he's actually a prop person. All right. Let me see, because there's a lot of like videos that, that you know, that's also another genre on TikTok and Instagram where it's someone telling you in a very monotone voice, 10 things you didn't know about Spider-Man with Tobey Maguire. And they're just reading stuff they just, found on Wikipedia. You know, they're just they're yeah. just something they saw on a a watch mojo and they're, you know, whatever. <laughs> Just <laughs> repeating. Yeah. But yeah. you're, you're somebody mm-hmm. in the business actually giving real things. And I even love the ones when you're not even talking about your own props. Uh, you've done a couple others where you're talking about uh, other movies. Like, Oh, I looked mm-hmm. into how they made this. And I think this and that, and I am a behind the scenes lover when it comes to the movie props. Cause I'm in it. And the reason I got into the entertainment industry is because I grew up watching and finding behind the scene videos, you know, you know, Fangoria magazine mm-hmm. and Tom Savini had a, a show that I came across when I was younger, where he taught you how to put a bullet hole in somebody's head by using a button attached to fishing line and then painted with, with paint to make it look. And then you pull it and there's the bullet hole. Like I, that imprinted on my brain, 
you know, and I it's a great trick. always yeah. have, have kept that in the brain. Yeah. I love behind the scenes stuff. And I love what, what you're doing with it. By the way, have you, have you met, have you met Tom Savini? No, I have not. I have not. I'm not as much as a horror fan as like my friends are, but I really like respect his work and what he's done. But I worked I've, with him on two movies and he's, he is the sweetest guy. He's super nice. Really? He loves teaching. Uh, he's just, just a good, good human being, good person to be around. I really like him. What were the two productions you worked on him with? Planet Terror. It was uh, Robert Rodriguez. Right. And uh, it, was the, it was part of the Grindhouse it was part two of the movie Grindhouse. with him and Tarantino. Yeah. Yep. And then, uh, and then Machete. what was the other production was, other than it was Machete. Oh, Machete. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you worked with him in all the Rodriguez productions. It was a Rodriguez. Okay. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Is there, who is your favorite, like who, like I always talk and I've written jokes about working with Chris Evans, uh, or as I say in the joke, Christopher Evans, because we're that close that I use his formal name. Uh, I get, I talk about how nice he is and like how I have a whole bit about how if women, if you really like Chris Evans and you want to catch him, just have a cute dog and walk around set because I've seen him get distracted by dogs so much. <laughs> and uh, and he is a, actually a really nice guy. And I've met a lot of really nice people. Who is the who is the nicest person you've met on mm-hmm. on working in your productions? The nicest. I don't know. I really, uh, you know, who I enjoyed the most talking to. I oh, mean, I've met a lot of people. Um, I'd say Francis McDormand. Right. It's hard to yeah. narrow down. Like, I have a small pool of things. Like, I, you know, going back to Nosferatu during lunch one day, um, Zachary Quinto in his full monster makeup came over during lunch and just tapped me on the shoulder and said, Hi, I'm Zach. And then we just talked while we're in the buffet line. And I tell that story is like, here's another story of somebody actually being nice and human. But you were saying Francis, Francis McDormand, Francis McDormand. She was, she's a Joel Cohen's wife, uh, but she's been in, Mm -hmm. uh, she was the star of Fargo. Um, uh, what else? A lot of the Cohen brothers movies. Uh, she's awesome. I really enjoyed her. John Krasinski was really fun to work with. Um, you know, from the office. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, uh, but I've worked with some old, like I really liked Ernest Borgnine, but he's, uh, uh, he, he passed away a long time ago. Uh, Ernest Borgnine is an old, you know, he was, he won the Oscar for a movie called Marty. He was uh, in the wild bunch. It, oh, you know, I will say, um, I really do like John Krasinski. That's, he's one of my favorites. Uh, from the office. Yes. And he's married to Emily Blunt and she was on set. Uh, you uh-huh. know, just, she was there to hang out. It was a, a show I shot in Pittsburgh that I did called promised land with, uh, directed by Gus Van Zandt and, okay. uh, Matt, Matt Damon and John Krasinski wrote the script. So I had to, uh, uh, and I think John probably wrote most of it. Uh, or a good, a good portion of it because he's the one I would go to when I had questions and everything. And he was just the sweetest guy ever. Just wonderful to be around. He, he made a big point of introducing me to his wife, Emily Blunt, who I just worship. She's just <laughs> so awesome. Um, and, uh, but they, they make a good team. Um, but yeah, I've, uh, yeah, I was, Chuck Norris was my boss for eight years. He was pretty cool. Um, that was a great, um, a great time. Was that's where I learned to learn the craft. It was in the 1990s on Walker, Texas Ranger. Yeah, that's a weird. Like saying I were Chuck Norris was my boss for eight years is definitely a sentence not a lot of people can say. And my only regret is I uh, he he never punched me. I I can't say. He, <laughs> I, I I just like one roundhouse kick, please. You know, just so I can say Chuck Norris kicked my ass. You know, but oh well. Oh, that's great. I mean, there's sometimes you want people to be, you know, you, you want them to fall into that role that you that you have in your head about them. You mm-hmm. know, like I got to meet John Aston, uh, who is one of my like all time favorites. You know, Gomez Adam from from the oh, Adams yeah. family was a TV show I grew up 
you know, watching it in reruns. I didn't watch it originally, but I watched it in reruns. You know, and then I just restarted watching the the Adventures of Briscoe County Junior. Uh, mm-hmm. because Rider Strike, I gotta find something to fall asleep to, and that's gonna oh, yeah. be now Briscoe County. And just grew up watching John Aston and so many things, and I got to watch the Adams Family musical with John Aston on like a <laughs> private uh sh- uh pre daytime preview before it went uh public and I just wanted him to be weird and all he was was just nice. I can't say anything bad. I'll, my only disappointment was he didn't say anything weird or, or kooky or give me a weird, crazy eye look like he would as Gomez. He was just like, yeah. "Oh hi, how you doing? Nice to meet you. I'm John. A- I'm John Adams. Like such a nice, sweet little, sweet little ninety-two year old man or whatever, yeah. however old he is." Yeah, I heard nothing so, but great things about about the man. What is the uh, working on set? So. For people who are listening and they're not familiar with the behind the scenes stuff, talk about a little bit of the hierarchy on set because you were just saying that you have to go to John Krasinski for all of uh, your questions when you're making that movie. For Let's talk about the hierarchy structure of conversation from pre-production to production. And I don't know, is there a lot of post-production work done with propping? Uh, a little bit. There, uh, we'll, well, I'll get to that. So yeah. uh, basically, uh, for let's keep it to television for now. So what we'll do is I'll get a script. Um, I'll do a do a breakdown, list all the props. I'll have a director's meeting. I'll meet with the director and the writer. You know, it, it, nowadays it's Zoom call, and I'll 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 have sent them my list so they can refer to it as I'm going through the script. And I hit every scene, and I'm like, okay, is there what are you really thinking for this? Or is, do you, does this work for you or you know, whatnot? Um, I don't do a show and tell just yet. So I, <laughs> I, it's, it's the early conversation of what do you, what do you want to see here? Or are we going to try to make something simpler, uh, simplify it in any way for TV? Um, and, you know, so that's the initial conversation. Then a couple days later, I'll have a show and tell where they physically come into the warehouse. I'll have everything laid out. And I get their approval and I get their thumbs up on every single, you know, what we call a hero prop. And a hero prop is something that is significant and to the story, you know, um, not, not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not worrying them with background, you know, beer mugs. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's all, you know, the hero stuff. And, uh, and if there's a, if there's a particular gag or, um, a fight scene or something, I'll show this is what I'm going to use. This is the rock we're going to hit the guy over the head with. And what do you think? You like the size, you know, that sort of thing. And then I'll submit a budget. So there's that's part of the hierarchy is I'll let the line producer know how much this is going to cost. And if he doesn't like what he sees, he can go to the director and the writer and say, hey, you're going to have to trim somewhere because this is how much Scott says it's going to cost. But that rarely happens because I kind of know what my pattern is, and I keep I try to keep everybody happy. I try to keep the producer happy, and the uh, the writer and director happy as well. And at the same, if it's a big food scene, uh, I'll call all the actors and say, "Hey, do you are you cool with eating whatever is you know is scripted?" Uh, you know, I, I I get to where I'll know all the food requirements for all the actors. You know, who the vegans are and who, who is, uh, you know, who will eat anything. Gluten-free. You know, Jared, Pat- Jared Padalecki will eat anything. <laughs> <laughs> How does he have such a good figure then? I don't know. That dude can eat. Uh, I watched him eat six hamburgers like it was nothing. <laughs> and he just, he's just always moving. He's always working out. He's always burning the calories, you know. So. When you're doing uh, food scenes, there's, you know, I know from... Behind the scenes, there's a lot of, you know, there's there's a bucket, you know, because somebody eats something that you don't want everybody. To, you can't sit there for 18 takes and keep mm-hmm. eating and eating and eating. So there's a lot of biting and spitting. That's uh, probably more feature world. In TV, we, we really? only do one or two takes. We okay. have, we actually, we always have a spit bucket on standby, but we rarely use it. it it's not that often. Unless it's something that someone really doesn't want to be eating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Something nasty. Well, I, well, I love the recent one I just saw the other day of you uh, showing people how to make fake eggs. Uh, I just for... yeah, that was a new one. 
Yeah. I wasn't a new one. See, that's I, the problem. I See, I don't, with TikTok, you don't know when things are posted anymore. Like, yeah. there's no timestamp on them. Like, so you tell me that your videos have been three years old. I didn't even know that. I honestly just thought you just started producing videos maybe a couple months ago, a year ago or something. I've made over 400, probably more than that, uh, closer to 600 videos. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. See, I didn't even know that because I don't go to the channel. I just wait for it to come out my feed and I, I enjoy watching them. Take a couple hours, go down the rabbit hole because uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot on there. Oh, don't worry. If I go down that rabbit hole, I'm not coming out. Like you tell me there's 600 videos. I'm going to have to stay away because I'll watch all 600. I love your content. And like I said, I love that behind the scenes stuff. And because I have uh, built a culture of behind the scene with like vi YouTube videos, like studio binder, film, riot, indie mogul, um, the Cinecom guys, there's a lot of already content of behind the scenes stuff coming to me. And it's, I love watching the difference between different channels where it's the handmade props and then it's the digital props. Mm -hmm. um, so, Quarter, do for, you watch Qu Quarter Crew? I do watch Quarter Crew. Oh, I love the Quarter Crew guys. I'm, I'm actually so mad that they don't produce blogs anymore. That it's just like the two, like they do two videos a week and every week mm -hmm. is a different react video, which their reactions are great videos. I mm -hmm. generally hate the reaction style videos where it's like, Oh, I'm watching Genesis for the first time. Oh, I've never heard this song before. Or the the oh, here's me reacting to a new trailer and it's all fake. Like their reaction yeah. videos are here's experts in the industry talking about yeah the thing, and I we'll love have, what they're they'll doing. They'll have the the VFX coordinator for Mission Impossible, and yeah, it's that that's that's a good reaction video. Or you know, because I'm I'm about to start that on YouTube for long form, um, and that's what I think what will make people want to watch is the the insider info. I'm not yeah. just reacting to a fight scene. I'm going to say how they, I'm going to pause it and say, this is how they do it. You know? Yeah. Them using the word react is, is not the right word. It's more like they're smart about the way they do their titling and stuff. Like mm -hmm. the, the quarter guys, uh, they follow the trends, but they still hold true to themselves mm -hmm. and they still do what they want to do, but they're also kind of leaning into that, like we kind of need to follow the trend kind of thing, but that, that's why I like them. I have a lot of huge amount of respect for them mm -hmm. because everything they've created. In fact, I've been sending their AI videos to other people complaining about AI. Um, but it's like, yeah, but you don't understand what they like. There's a whole AI is a whole nother conversation. And me is barely an actor and you as a prop master. I don't know if the two of us are qualified to talk about AI. So I shouldn't bring it up because I, I'm pretty sure AI is not going to be stealing your job of finding, uh, finding and organizing props. Well, you never know. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, my daughter wants to go uh, be a concept artist, and I think that you know it could definitely affect that part of it. Um, it'll, yeah. You know, it it will it'll affect uh, you know at least secondarily uh, in some ways. I mean, it, it it can be helpful in others, you know. But well, I don't know. Well, it's it's still still the wild. It's not even the wild west yet. Uh, of AI, it's still it, they have manifest gonna, destiny territory. Yeah, it's gonna hit. It'll it'll be hitting, and we're all gonna have to adapt one way or the other. Some people will just have to readjust the way they do things. Yeah, and also like there's it. It should be used as a tool. It shouldn't be used as a replacement. Like we've been using AI is just the next level of machine learning, and Pixar has been using machine learning to fill in the keyframe between keyframes of their animation for decades, almost mm -hmm. probably for almost 20 years. Yep. Like I think the second toy story movie used machine learning to fill in frames between uh, key poses. So there's already a point where software is taking, not nah, taken away. I mean, that's what in, you know, early animators were doing where they were doing the keyframe, the poses, you know, just the frames that the drawings in between the keyframes, you would hire a new, right. A new artist you do that, and that's how you work your way up. No, now machine learning has replaced that position. But will it only be fully replaced by AI in the future? I don't think so. No, it's just those artists will be able to use those tools to create easier uh, and more efficiently, hopefully, in the future. We'll see. I don't know. Yeah, where, you know? where it will affect will be the lower-level jobs. Same with writers yeah. as far as the, you know, the the kind of mechanical stuff that the, the higher end, you know, as far as the higher up the ladder writers or artists or editors, uh, the stuff they didn't want to do, they fluff it off to the new kid, right? Well, it's, it's probably going to take the new kid's job. You know, the new kid will be AI for a while, if that makes sense. 
Yeah. Now, our, for cause since we're talking about unions, and I know there's a lot of different unions based in the industry. As a, is there a prop guild? Is there a, is there, are uh, for you as a prop master? Is there a union or a group that you are a part of or can be a part of? I'm in the union. It's uh, it's IOTC. It's the international, and okay. that covers that covers makeup artists, gaffers, uh, camera camera people. Um, See, I knew IOTC covered okay. cam- like camera, sound, mm-hmm. and those people. I didn't know if it went full to like mm-hmm. I'm. I'm new to knowing it covering yep. prop and makeup as well. It, it does. Now there are separate guilds as well. I mean, uh, we, I, I'm one of the founding members of the property masters guild, which is more of, of kind of a lobbying group to kind of get the, you know, let people know that we exist kind of thing, but, we, but it's not a, a, a collective bargaining group. Uh, the collective bargaining group is uh, the IOTC you know, as far as they do the, you know, the contract negotiation. Now, but, IOTC uh, is supporting WGA and SAG. Mm-hmm. Uh, are there, is their collective bargaining coming up soon as well? Is that a thing that where we, they supported us on our, on our strike as a SAG member, they supported us, IOTC. Is that mm-hmm. also going to be, if, 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 and when SAG and WGA wins this battle, are we going to go right back into not for two the years. same thing with the prop uh, with the IATSE in the future or two years because we negotiated last last year. Okay, so they're two years away. So there's a potential for two years uh, where we're all back to not work again. Uh, uh, I, which, it won't be like this. This is you know this will set the precedent. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, you think so? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, because I mean that you know we for the longest you know after you know the the you know Reagan set the thing in the what what 66 or whatever it was it was a long time before a long strike like this mm-hmm. whatever it was but uh I don't know it's it's worse I'm like I'm barely a part of anything like right now honestly I owe SAG money I'm I, I owed back due so I'm not even a part of the strike anyway mm-hmm. <laughs> like they only I literally have to pay a thousand dollars just to be able to go down and be a strike member at this point <laughs> oh wow yeah yeah no I I mean you know not, not everybody had you know, a good time during the pandemic as much as I did. Some of us fall <laughs> fell behind. We're all working to, to oh, catch yeah. up still. But uh, so what is uh, for, is there an expansion? Do you feel like when we go back to work, do you feel like your company is at the base for expansion? Like, are you going to expand your property or your, your prop mastering and hire on more people? Or do you think you're able to continue at the same level of your business as it is now? Well, you know, I'm only one person, so I would I will continue to prop master and then have you know my regular team. I, I might try to expand expand the prop shop. Um, I I definitely want to keep up with the videos. I, I enjoy doing yeah. them, uh, and see how that goes. Um, uh, there's a big incentive in Texas, so you know it would be a good prime time to expand. The problem is. Uh, I'm waiting to find out if the state of Texas, the way it's been previously, is they vote on the incentive every two years. So it's hard for the state of Texas to build an infrastructure, like start uh-huh. building studios. Like Atlanta, they've got long, a long, Georgia has a long-term deal, right? So okay. people are, are building brick-and-mortar businesses and studios there um, until they can get a long-term agreement with the state of Texas, you know, it's 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 hard to make a long term investment in Texas film industry. Does that make sense? No, it makes total sense so, because so uh, I'm I think waiting that to the... see what what the outcome is, and if if you know because what happened to us a few years ago uh, in 2017, it's like a different group of lawmakers came in uh, who did not like the film incentive, and they chopped it from 100 million down to 36 million. So oh, from 2017 geez. until now, it's been a $36 million for every two years. Well, now it's $200 million because there's a different group of lawmakers in. But what's to say in two years, there's not a whole other regime that comes in and says, no, we don't like that. You know, we don't want, you know, don't, we don't want to be giving money to the Hollywood liberals. That's what, that's, <laughs> that's typically what they say. No, that makes total sense because like here in Massachusetts, our tax credit, I think, comes up every four years. 
So mm -hmm. just me being here 10 years, I've seen two, at least two, I know off the top, man, at least two or three uh, different votes, uh, you know, supporting, like, make sure you tell your representatives to keep the tax incentive, which, you know, that makes sense, dude. It's hard to want to expand your business if you don't know that there's going to be business in the next couple of years. Like I said, with New Orleans. That's why they need to come up with a way to do, because I feel like Georgia came up with a way where they have like something that's like a 10 year guarantee or something. And with when you have that kind of guarantee, people are going to say, oh, hell yeah, I'll build a studio there. I'll open up my sound design Foley studio in Georgia or whatever it is that it's, you know, but it's, it's a little difficult to take on a, you know, a four year lease on a building. Uh, and when you don't know if in two years, it's all going to go away. You see what I'm saying? No, uh, I totally understand, man. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm sorry. I could talk about that crap for hours. But <laughs> I mean, I'll listen to that for hours. That's a like that is part of our industry is sometimes worrying about that longevity of things. Like, and it's you know uh, for the people in front of the camera, there's also you know a, a, a longevity when it comes to age and looks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like honestly, right? Me as a radio personality, a comedian, voiceover actor, and an in person actor, my voice is incredibly important to me. Mm -hmm. And I have never, ever in my entire life lost my voice with the exception of being sick. I have never taught out, out talked my, or out shouted my voice until May of this year, until June of this year, when I started working for a tourism company here in Boston, we do, there's these vehicles called duck boats. They're amphibious mm -hmm. vehicles from the yeah, from world sure. war II we that have. we drive around the city and in the river in. and up until about two weeks ago, I sounded like this since for the past three months. <laughs> Just doing nonstop tars and so. doing it and talking. And for my biggest fear right there is losing my voice because that's, I've built my entire life and career off mm -hmm. this uh, terribly, incredibly cavernous and also nasally sounding voice at the same time. It's raspy, it's bassy, but it's also nasally. It's mm -hmm. uh, sounds like a truck of screaming babies screaming into the night, uh, screaming as they crash into a nitroglycerin factory, but. It is my brand, you know, and so I, you know, I can't change my brand to Harvey Firestein, you know, I can't switch those things over. So the, uh, the, the last thing we're going to we'll talk about is actually what really inspired me to contact you about the video, uh, doing this podcast episode, because a, I haven't talked to any prop masters and I love to talk about people about the jobs that not only is, that we have to do as artists to support what we have to do, but I also love talking to the people who have to, their day jobs is supporting the industry of entertainment that we have to do. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the, the YouTube, your YouTube channel and your, your Facebook and the Instagram and uh, TikTok and all that. And what really inspired was seeing the video about someone impostering your account, stealing your videos. And mm -hmm. I am a one man raging war on the internet, trying to stop people from stealing videos. Like so much of TikTok right now, is just people stealing old episodes of Family Guy and just putting the clips out and getting millions of, of likes for it. And I don't yeah, understand the people that, like, the people that, I get the impetus between I'm just going to steal videos and put them out there instead of creating content. I get that. Like, cover bands exist for a reason. People want the accolades of being a musician and have people applaud them, but they also don't want to spend the time make it, making original music. But mm -hmm. the, the internet, the people who hit like on a clearly stolen video from The Simpsons, I don't understand that 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 impetus, and I am a one man raging war against imposterism on the internet. So mm -hmm. you're yeah. personally affected by this right now. And the only time I'll use a clip is if I if you have something to add to it, like like oh yeah, rock, I know you're like you're rocking. creating. You know what I mean? So if you use it, but uh, then you got like fair use. But when people just outright, I mean, like that person on Facebook, uh, whoever it is, you know, they just they they use the exact same. Uh, page name, yeah. And my mom followed the wrong person. You know that, <laughs> it, yeah. So that tells you right there. And you know, Facebook came back with, "Oh well, uh, we can't take down a fan site." Well, that's that's not a fan site. You know, it's like they they copied the name, and they posted sixty six of my video. I mean, I mean, there's no, you know, it's just theft. You know? So how did you find out about the theft page? Uh, you know, I, I think I just, because I've dealt with this before on YouTube, I, I just put my name in on uh Facebook search and happened upon it. But it so that is something you're aware of, you were being aware of, you were looking in your own, in your own 
safety and self interest. Oh yeah, there's there's like six different TikTok pages, but none of them had blown up like the, like this person. Mm-hmm. I had not. It's a long story as to why I didn't have a big presence on Facebook. I just um, at the time when I started that page, which I started it in January of 2022, um, it wouldn't allow you to post longer than 30 seconds yeah. reels. So most of my reels were over 30 seconds. So I was like, well, I just didn't mess with it. You know, I posted a few of my shorter ones, but, um, but then apparently I guess it, at some point they opened it up to where you could post longer reels and, uh, that person jumped in this last, uh, uh, June. They, they amassed with my videos, they were able to get 70,000, uh, 70,000, uh, followers in, from June to July in one month. Jeez. Like, why can't can that work out for the people like you and me that are creating things like, yeah, I've had. You know, I, you know, I, I tried selling you on the podcast by dropping big names in my podcast and some of my big name videos go nowhere. And I'm like, there's no likes, there's no shares. And I'm like, all right. So I just brought you a great interview with Lewis Black, you know, uh-huh. on a clip on TikTok and mm-hmm. it's get 12 views. I'm like, but then my friend who is a bouncer at a nightclub, his clip gets, you know, 2000 views or whatever. You know, I'm just making up numbers. No, but there's no rhyme, no reason. It's it's weird. I, I've yet to be able to figure out the algorithm. I yeah, just, there's no rhyme or reason why things happen. And it always seems like the people who don't deserve... It, it's not about quality of content either, because I've seen terrible quality mm-hmm. content up there. Oh, yeah. Thousands of thousands and millions of likes and stuff like that. So it's not quality. Is it... It's, it's, it's time and day. Is it like wrapping my head around the algorithm on when to post things is just maddening in and off in itself, and I can't think about it. I don't think time of day matters, to be honest. You know, I had one video uh, on prop prop cigarettes, I think it was what it was. And for some reason, I get, you know, if you have the, uh, something like cigarettes, it immediately went to review. So TikTok held on to it until, you know, they could review it and then decide, yes, we're going to let this go. So I posted it at like 7 p.m., right? Um, and they didn't, they didn't release it to people until like 4 a.m., which made me really mad. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, really? You're going to let this out? I'm like, no one's going to see it. But people saw it. I mean, by, by 5 a.m. when I woke up, it had a, you know, close to a million views. I was like, yeah. So there's just no a rhyme, no reason to it. You know, so I don't think it matters when you post. I think consistency and throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks. Um, I think having something that's kind of sensationalized is, uh, helps. Yeah, uh, always, yeah, something that really makes people laugh. Something that um, uh, that's short. Uh, yeah, you know, like the some of the of the shorts, like ten second videos, tend to just really pop. They don't necessarily. I don't know. I had one where I duetted. Uh, there's a prop person out of California who did this like eight second video about rub- silicone glass and I did I duetted it and showed silicone glass at the same time that thing got 27 million views i didn't necessarily make a ton of followers off of it but that was a ton of views <laughs> yeah you know, and there, the, it's the anecdotal incidents that just is maddening i don't know sorry i my, i I have an I have a disorder that's fixed. And not, I have an obsessive disorder that's not fixed by medication. So sometimes, you know, I dwell on these things unhealthily, and I know it's unhealthily. So at least that's a step in the right direction. It's really trying trying different things, and not and you got to be consistent. You know, it's like you gotta, you know, keep posting, keep posting, keep posting. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's you are the algorithm often rewards uh, consistency, but also at the so. same time. Uh, they, they, you know, my, my, another comedian friend of mine, Will Abels, who is uh, releasing a comedy special, we were talking about his and he started doing consistent daily videos and he noticed a change in things, uh, you know, in, in views and, and shares and stuff like that. But then he also noticed a difference in his advertisements coming from Instagram, whereas mm-hmm. like, uh, all of a sudden the advertisements shifted to, 
hey, are you trying to grow your business? Do you want to learn? Do you want to grow more followers and stuff? So they even know when you're trying to grow your followers that they're going to entice you to grow your followers by giving you ads to grow. You know, it's mm-hmm. there's there's so much sh- chicanery going on in the algorithm of social media that it oh, yeah. is uh, disheartening sometimes to try and uh, maintain it. But I'm glad that you have a healthy, positive attitude towards it and that you're working your way through it so well but i've been lucky i've i've been i feel like i'm just lucky (laughs) yeah i don't know um i mean because i'll try to give people advice on well this is what i did and they're like well that's not working for me well i guess every person's different i don't know i've i've been fortunate to have some i mean to i it wasn't just one video that went viral i've been able to kind of keep that going like one in 10 videos will hit, but you still, that there's those nine in between that you got to suffer through and think, what did I do wrong? And then, Oh, okay. We got another one. You know, we're back on track. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. So what is the process now for trying to get that channel shut down? I know you did a video asking everyone to report it. You've done things. Is there, is there anything else that listeners can do to help? Is there anything that you can do? Um, yeah, I think I just, I need to, uh, hire a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, that's what I had to do. That's what I had to do on YouTube. I, had, I went through the same thing two, two and a half years ago with, uh, there was someone that created a YouTube channel called the prop master and they used my profile picture and all my video, like 40 of my videos. And they, same situation. They had amassed about, you know, just under a hundred thousand subscribers. Um, I went in and I did copyright strikes on, all 40 of the videos took me like a day and a half to do it. Uh And, uh, it was, it was a pain. And then they still didn't do anything. They left the person up. Uh, I hired a, a lawyer, a lawyer wrote a letter to YouTube. Um, finally, then I did one of those videos like you saw on mine, uh, Uh where people got on and reported and the person pulled all the videos down and changed the channel name. I think they got to keep the subscribers, but they, they totally, you know, deleted all my videos. All right. Well, at least that's some kind of a win and, and a, a small win, but mm-hmm. it's just disheartening. Like, honestly, we, you know, there's, you know, I talk a lot about mental health uh, in my standup because I don't, I don't, I want to remove the stigma from it. And I can tell you right now, if I'm, I have a similar incident. It's nowhere near in the level, day, but I know what it did to me mentally. Mm. And I c- applaud anyone who can get through this without curling up into a ball and turning out the lights and hiding under the covers of your bed. Just wondering, like for me, a clip of my podcast, a- another TikToker took a clip of my podcast, duetted with it. Um, and last I checked, it had 300,000 views, which, you know, and that, but my, my video with that same, person has 57 views or, you know, 57 likes mm-hmm. or whatever it is, you know? And it's like, I literally for a couple of days, we're s- s- mentally spiraling out of control yeah. thinking about how this person is gaining off a clip of my podcast, but they cut my voice at it. They just used my guest's voice. They commented on it. They got a ton of likes. People in the comments were talking about it, but none of the comments were ever coming back to my podcast. There was yeah. no, increase in listenership and and there was no increase in downloads there was no increase the and it, it it was like i'm working hard for this and somebody's profiting off of it and i did not handle it well oh, i mean I've i handled the, it fine i'm here today thing. but it's like i yeah. i obsessed over it for a while uh and i i can't imagine like if on the level of where you're at where where you're actually literally this is your business now you mm-hmm. know while we're in the middle of this strike and stuff that this is you know, bringing in some, some kind of, Oh yeah. And because of that person, I can't monetize on Facebook. I don't know if they reported me, me or something, but it's saying that my, uh, my material is not authentic and, uh, I'm unable to monetize my Facebook. And, yeah, and that's literally hurting your business. Oh, yeah. 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 So I think that the person got upset that, you know, because, when I posted that, everyone got on there and reported that person, right? So, uh, and it, and they've got like a, a one out of 10 rating. Uh, and I think they got mad and then they like put some sort of strike on me. I don't know, but. <laughs> or uh, the worst case scenario is that some of your followers 
who were like, all right, we're going to help Scott. We're going to go report that guy and then reported your page by accident. <laughs> well, yeah, that and that could have happened too. I don't know. <laughs> Um, I think that might have, that that's you know that's actually a good thought that that might have happened, but that's that's uh, this catastrophizing OCD brain right there is what that was. Well, that easily could have happened because somebody got on mine thinking that they were reporting the wrong as far as on the uh, ratings. You see what I'm saying? Like where you yeah. where you can go on and uh, kind of like a Yelp rating and whatever. But it uh, all I know is. I do. I'm doing what I can do, and that is post videos on Facebook. I started doing that whenever I found out about this uh, to try to build my page out. Um, and I've gone from 500 followers on my Facebook page to 100, almost 130 thousand, and I was able to do it in less than a month. Wow! I posted yeah. five videos a day to get caught oh. up to try to surpass the fake me. So I've surpassed, I've surpassed the fake me by 50,000, 60, <laughs> whatever. So. Well, I hope I didn't give you more things to dwell and worry right. about when it comes to the scenario. Okay. <laughs> no. And you know, one thing I will say it, what, what you also deal with that can mess with your mental health is the negative people, <laughs> the people that, that the trolls yep. that try to try to draw you into a fight. And the best advice I can give you on that is 100% ignore it. Don't give it any fuel at all. Uh, not even, even if you think I have the best comeback for this person, it's not worth it. Because yeah. they'll just come back at you tenfold. And you're doing, you're feeding into what they're, they want a response. Right? Yeah. That's all. And the, you, the best thing you can do is to not respond. And and that that pisses them off more than anything, and they just go off. It may not piss them off; they'll just go on to someone else. Yeah, and, and they also don't know. have an emotional stake in this conversation like we would have in it. No, there it's a game for them. So it's like, okay, I'm just not gonna respond. All you right. Know? Well, Scott, there's been uh, an enlightening conversation on more of the background of the world of movie and TVs. I'm really glad to hear that the social media is working for you. And I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, maybe, maybe I'll be in Texas soon after all of this and I get myself back good with SAG and I dive deep in that. Maybe we'll actually be on a production where we know we're both there and we can actually toast each other, uh, at the, uh, crafty table. Sounds great. Sounds good. I really enjoyed it. Dennis. Awesome. Well, good luck with everything. And, uh, where can everyone find your social media links? Uh, uh, what are all, what's the title of all the social media? Um, Scott prop and roll will work. Scott Prop and Roll. You can you can also just look up Scott Props, and I'll probably come up. I'm on <laughs> YouTube, uh, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Just make sure it's me, and make sure if you find the other Facebook account, report them. <laughs> make sure it's the Facebook page with my picture. <laughs> awesome, Scott. Yeah. This was a good conversation. I'm glad All we right. got to have it today. Thanks a lot, Dennis. You have a good one. <laughs>